Testing. You're getting it. Okay. Testing, 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 testing. So one as soon as you want to start the new I need someone to I need someone Thank you. 
Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if yes, this mic works. Hey, everyone. Um, we're starting the NPA meeting now. Um, I am Roxanne. I'm on the steering committee. Uh, other steering committee members are Charlie, who's manning the video camera. Um, Chris is maybe getting dinner. And Barbara is on screen here. And I think that's we have other members um, that can make it, but um, that's who's here tonight. Um, so we're starting with announcements. Uh, so I have the agenda on my phone. That's why I'm looking at my phone. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you ever want to present at an NPA meeting, you can go to our website and or the city and or the city's website and there's a form you can fill out to request time. Um, the next meeting is Thursday, October 13th. Recordings of meetings can be found on YouTube or CCTV's website. And um, so first, a uh, more new announcement is that community grant applications are now open. So that's a yearly thing we do. NPAs have money to uh, give to individuals or organizations that want to do something for the community. There are certain guidelines for it. There's a whole uh, list of, there's a whole timeline for that. Um, all the info is on the website. And let's see, yeah, so we have a total of 5,000 to give out for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. And limits of $750 per thing. Sorry, yes, not used to holding mics. Um, so the main point there was just there are community grants. We have money. If you think of a fun project for the community, let us know about it and maybe we can help fund it. And there is, we have a, a survey out on our website that we'd love for, if you haven't filled it out yet, please do. Please send it to other people, whether they know what an NPA is or not. Uh, it's a way to find out what people are looking for from the NPA. And that will help us figure out how to plan meetings, how to plan things beyond meetings, and how to better serve the community. And uh another announcement we are we could use more steering committee members and if i can do it you can do it especially from ward two we, that is underrepresented on our steering committee um it doesn't take too much of it's not too much of a commitment it's attending meetings if you can't make it it's okay it happens and then we have steering committee meetings also once a month Sorry if I haven't been holding this close enough. Um, and it's a good group and we'd love to have more people. And the last announcement. So next we'll go into the public forum and that last 10 minutes um, or until 6.50 anyways, everyone gets two minutes to speak. I know there's a couple of people we're expecting to speak tonight. Um, but anyone is 
welcome to let us know. Uh, we have a few mics around. Jeannie has one, I have one, and we'll pass it off to you. And make sure to identify yourself by name and ward when you talk. Um, and just so you know, the whole agenda, sorry, we don't have them printed out today, but after public forum, we will uh, spend some minutes remembering Tony Reddington, who passed recently. He was a very active member of the community, known for uh, an appreciation of roundabouts and safe bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. So we'll have some time to talk about him. He was also a member of our steering committee. Um, after that, the bulk of this meeting, the next hour after that will be about the high school, uh, about the design and the funding of it. So we've got different people related to that here tonight. So there will be chances to ask questions then. So save any high school related questions, discussion for that instead of public forum, if you can. And at the end, we'll have our city councilors and state reps and such speak. And we should wrap up at 8.30. Uh, so now we can start public forum. Who would like to speak? Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. My name is Milo Grant. I live in Ward 3. I've lived mostly in wards two and three for my almost 40 years in Burlington. It's it's getting there. And I currently serve on the police commission where some of you might have heard my name. I just want to check in more because a lot of the things that are happening um, in Burlington are happening in our communities, wards two and three. We've been feeling the brunt of it for quite some time. Um, I feel like we've been the canaries in the coal mine for the city of Burlington, where things have started here and our wards and kind of spread out, uh, talking about the uh, increase in crimes of opportunity, which wasn't taken seriously until recently. Uh, the city is now mailing out flyers, creating an online site, giving people tips on how to protect their property. They are also encouraging people to register their bicycles at um, a registration site that they have created. Keep in mind, a lot of people have already been using Bike Index, UVM, because after the first week, they had a series of bikes that were stolen. They sent out an email to UVM students saying you need to use Bike Index. So it, the word that I've given to the mayor and to BPD is please use both. Use the city's registration, use bike index, anything that you own that has a serial number, you should register with the city. Have current pictures of everything. Please don't think this can't happen to you. I've seen roughly five incidents where people are just trying doors. They're just trying doors. They're not out to you know do serious damage, but people are leaving keys. People leave duplicates of keys in their cars. People leave their cars running. So the, the issue with the cars is getting really out of control, but it's, it's we don't want to victim blame, but unfortunately there are basic steps that we all need to do in order to keep ourselves and our stuff safe. I encourage everyone please to watch the meetings for the police commission. You can watch them live. You can watch them later on YouTube. You don't have to watch them all at once. You can watch them a little bit at a time. It's really important to see the conversations that we are having. We also periodically have guests. We've been trying to add an educational component to the meetings. And um, after the yearly report was reviewed and detailed recently, we're gonna get, be getting back to that. Um, the final thing is, and I know people are gonna hate me for bringing this up, but another discussion we need to have with the city, with the department and with the superintendent in the high school is a parent who has a son in BHS approached me yesterday and told me that another student pulled a gun on his child. There apparently was semantics with the school as to where it actually happened. As we all know, the high school is in the Macy's building. So what constitutes school property? Because it wasn't actually inside the school, it was outside the school. So is that on the way to school, is that on the way from school? things like that. Parent brought up the need for possibly a medical detector. Well, the answer he got back for that, he said, was how is that going to look? So we have to start thinking about this because if this happened to one child, guarantee you it's happening to other child children. 
So this is something that needs to be talked about out loud in terms of exactly what is being done to get through to some of these kids. What have you tried before? Exactly what have you tried before? And if it's failed, what new thing are you trying? And are you including their peers? And thank you. I know I went a little bit over my time. My email for city commission is megrant at burlingtonvt.gov. My personal email is milogrant at gmail.com, M-E-L-O-G-R-A-N-T. Please feel to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Um, is there anyone online who is has raised their hand? Anyone here? Oh, sorry, was someone online? Was someone online gonna, okay. Um, I'm Trish Denton. I live in Ward 3. I am your neighbor, but I'm also the director of In Tandem Arts, which is a community-based arts organization based in the South End. And I wanted to announce a couple of opportunities that are coming up with In Tandem. We use the performing arts and storytelling to shift cultural narratives. And this is a really important time to be doing that work with youth. Unfortunately, In Tandem has received an expanding access grant from Vermont After School to establish a new after school program. And so we're working with um, schools all over Burlington and community-based organizations um, in partnership with the Media Factory to do um, a new program for teens ages 14 to 19 to create an original performance that is a platform for teen voice. And so that is going to be happening um, starting September 20th and we'll premiere something December 2nd and the 3rd. And so I just wanna put that out there. If there are any teens in your life who um, are looking for a platform for expression, looking for a place to have creative community, um, our space is available to them. Also, um, we have a full lineup of workshops and events that are dedicated to um, holding that space for adults and newcomers to the arts, people who have always taken an interest in performing, have wanted to express themselves in that way, but didn't necessarily have the opportunity to be a part of lessons or you know fancy schooling and those things it's just a drop in space to get together and do a circle sing or share some stories and so I just wanted to um, put that out there as your neighbor and also as a community-based artist that I would love to spend some time with you in that space this fall thank you and I'm gonna hand it to you next sure. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is AJ Rossman and I have a business in Ward 3, used to be, used to live there quite a while and now I'm Ward 7. Um, I am representing IoT Conduit, which is a, a community-based uh, citizen science uh, initiative that's been funded by UVM Vice President for Research and Cambrian Rise. Uh, we are going to be applying for a, a National Renewable Energy Lab community planning grant. Uh, we will be recycling a proposal that we had for a power connector where we had, uh, you know, we had great connections and letters of recommendation, uh, Vermont Community Loan Fund, or I mean, Sustainable Jobs Fund rather, um, their Delta Climb Accelerator, Green Mountain Power, VTTA. Uh, the two organizations that we were missing was anybody from the city of Burlington and Burlington Electric. So this time around, we would love to get more participation from the city for a community planning grant to support the next generation of energy entrepreneurs. It's called an Epic Prize too. So anybody who's more interested in that or can help build relationships with the city to see what this kind of innovation might be able to do for our goals would be great. Uh, anyone else looking to speak in person or oh, we've got a Zoom person? Hi, um, wondering if you all can hear me. Um, 
I actually am a, represent a representative from Burlington City Arts, um, and we wanted to bring everyone in Ward 2 and 3 up to speed on the exciting sculpture that will be being installed in Dewey Park um, this spring. Um, in the fall of 2021, the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Department um, put forth as one of their initial goals um, was to create a work of public art that would establish a focal point in the community um, as a point of community pride, a destination for people to come and celebrate and gather and appreciate their community together. Um, and they coordinated with us at Burlington City Arts um, to put forth a national search um, for artists, um, both, and collect proposals from across the um, country, both Burlingtonian artists, Vermont artists, and um, ultimately five finalists were selected to be paid $1,000 to develop proposals. Um, and Humanity Memorial um, was selected um, and commissioned to complete the project um, earlier this spring, um, they were. And the system has progressed far enough that they have provided us with a design document that we were able to update um, you all and the community with um, that sort of details the project in a better light. So um, in April and March of, the, of this coming year, there will be a 20 foot tall um, metal sculpture that uh, represents two stand Cooper um, in an intertwined um, orientation um, that will act um, as a sort of focal point for um, ideas of belonging and embrace. Um, and the piece is called Embrace and Belonging. Um, and we will be posting sort of a zoning um, permit out to get public feedback and would love to hear um, if anyone has any questions or comments about the piece and the process and we'll be doing more public meetings in the area. Um, would love to do more in-depth um, sort of question and answer period um, at a forthcoming MPA meeting um, if that is of interest to the community. Um, and we're more than happy to field any questions. Um, my email is cstores at Burlington City Arts. Um, and any email that you might have uh, at DCA would get their way to us. And we'd love to talk more with everyone in the community. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more person at the full two minutes to speak. Is there anyone else? Um, I will also say there's someone who got in touch and was hoping to make an announcement. I don't think they're here, but um, I think Dan Cahill from the traffic department uh, wanted to spread the word that they are looking for more crossing guards. Um, so if anyone's interested uh, or can pass that on. Um, and also, um, since I introduced steering committee members earlier, we now have Mayumi from the steering committee here on Zoom. So, hello. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, if that is all, we'll move on to the next part where um, we're going to have some time to talk about Tony Reddington. Uh, Barbara. Hi, everybody. Um, Jessica asked me if I would say a few words about Tony, and I'm happy to do so. Um, I served with Tony on the Ward 2-3 MPA for 
Um, his 10 years may be eight for me, but he was, he was from the time he moved to Burlington, he was a Ward 3 rep and then a Ward 2 one. Uh, Tony was a consummate activist and a true public citizen. He was a compendium of knowledge about road and street safety, housing, and a myriad of other subjects. In Burlington, he never owned a car. You could see him ride his bike everywhere and in every season. He was a founding member of the Coalition for a Livable City, which in the last decade took on several Burlington issues, including the mall that's now called the Pit, Burlington College Land, South End Gentrification, um, the gentrification of City Hall Park, Burlington Tele Telecom, the F-35, and most recently the Pine Street Coalition. Um, he fought to make a better road than the proposed outdated and environmentally racist Champlain Parkway. He was a consummate advocate for the use of roundabouts, which he knew to be safer than most um, signaled intersections. We activists are often accused of being selfish and entitled NIMBYs. Let me tell you that Tony did not have a selfish bone in his body. What he did, he did for the good of the city and everyone in it and everyone knew it. He was steadfast, indefatigable, knowledgeable, unremittingly positive, even in the way he dealt with his final illness, never complaining, always positive. He always showed up, never gave up, kept his spirits up, and he kept our spirits up too. I can't believe I'm not gonna bump into him at the Roxy or eating at City Market or at our weekly breakfast at the Friendly Toast. He is truly irreplaceable. I will miss him and so will Burlington. I believe that the Shelburne Street roundabout that is now under construction would not be being built if it weren't for Tony. And I and others have proposed that in his honor and in his memory, it be called the Reddington Roundabout. Um, I'm hoping that the NPA can somehow help operationalize this. I'm not exactly sure how. In my tradition, we say Tony, Redd Tony Reddington, may his memory be for a blessing. Thank you so much. Did anyone else want to speak about Tony, Chris? All right. Does anyone else want to say anything before we move on? If there was audio on that, what Chris said, it wasn't heard on Zoom. Okay. Hi. So um, I'm Polly Vanderputten. I live in Ward 3, and I've been on the school board since 2020. And I got sworn in during the pandemic, which meant everything for me happened over Zoom. And I never got to meet Tony in person. I only got a sense of him and his advocacy and his community spirit from those Zoom meetings. But I found him to be so inspiring. And I do hope we continue to make the bike and safety improvements to the streets that he would have wanted. I think that's his legacy. So I'm really going to miss him. And I say that to say this is someone I only ever met on a computer screen. Anyone else? Um, cool. Um, I also. So my experience with Tony is I used to do transportation planning. And so a couple of times spoke at public meetings and he was always there and <laughs> always had something to say, which sometimes was a little tough, but also 
appreciated. Uh, he was, he cared a lot and he um, had a lot of the right ideas about things. Um, and roundabouts are really great. They are safe and <laughs> they're better for pedestrians. They also reduce uh, pollution because cars don't idle like they do at uh, normal intersections with a signal. So um, in his honor, I wanted to speak about roundabouts and uh, they are different from rotaries, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, roundabouts force you to slow down before entering them. And that's part of why they're safer. Um, so yeah, great. Anyone else? Cool. Uh, we can move on to the, uh... <laughs> I'm not as passionate about it as him, but I am inspired. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, hi everyone. My name is Joe. I'm the city councilor for Ward Three, and uh, like Polly, I um, got elected during the pandemic uh, in a special election last year, and um, really myself only knew Tony. Um, on the computer and, um, you know, would see him riding his bike and uh, outside various coffee shops downtown and uh, knew Tony through his very, very long and very, very plentiful emails that he would send to us. And as somebody who didn't have a uh, great knowledge of uh, all things public works um, and didn't really get that great of an orientation to um uh transportation and the uh complexities of it um tony's emails were uh, a real education for me um and i really deeply admired his commitment to uh, a safer transportation system for all of us and uh it's certainly something that will not leave me um uh, certainly for my service on the council and uh definitely after i leave as well so uh, he will certainly be missed. Thank you so much. Um, we are now got one more person. I'm shy, but oh well. Can you hear me? Okay. So Tony brought so much to this space, and I'm just going to miss him. Just he brought so much life to this space. So if there's some way we can honor him somehow even like a little plaque or something that would be awesome i just want to put that out there reddington roundabout reddington roundabout great anyone else who's been thinking about speaking and <laughs> now wants to all right um so that being said we will move forward with our agenda uh so the next hour is devoted to the high school. Um, and we've got a couple school commissioners here and a couple of people that will introduce themselves. <laughs> Wanna start at that end of the table? Wanna introduce ourselves? Sure. Okay. Did you guys have our presentation? Yeah, yeah. yeah. just updated. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So we get it up. Just let them get the presentation up. I have a scramble. I have a medical event. What's it? Are you okay? I'm, I'm okay. I'm, nothing's broken. Actually, is it confirmed that it was yesterday? I I uh, fell off my bike during a race and then on my shoulder. It was like a pretty hard fall. 
but I'm all right. I'm all right. Yeah, exactly. You're all right. Mr. Ali. You speak with this thing up. Okay. 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 I'm good. All right. Ready to go? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, thanks for having us, everyone. My name's Nathan Lavery. I'm the Burlington School District's Executive Director of Finance and Operations. I'm Jean Waltz. I'm the Commissioner representing the Old North End. That would be Ward 2 and 3. Holly Vanderputten, and I live in Ward 3, and I represent that um, district on the school board. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, and I guess, and I live in Ward 2 on Hyde Street. Um, okay, so we will jump into the presentation that we have. We also have some handouts, which I believe uh, have been distributed already, which is great. So this presentation relates to the November ballot item that the school district has requesting authorization to borrow. 165 million in support of building a new high school and technical center on Institute Road. Um, next slide, please. So we wanted to provide a really brief history of the project for those of you who may not be familiar with how we arrived at this point. Um, in short, we began a, an effort um, a few years ago to renovate our existing high school campus. Uh, part of that process, as folks may recall, was that we asked voters to authorize a $70 million bond to support that project. During the course of that project, we discovered the presence of PCBs in the building materials within the building, as well as in some of the soils. And that ultimately meant that we could no longer continue to use the high school, which is the why the high school campus or the students are now attending in Macy's. It also, after a careful analysis, revealed that we could not, in a fiscally responsible way, actually remove the PCBs in their entirety. There were, they were simply too widespread. We would never be able to guarantee a PCB-free building. Um, one question that has come up that I'll just touch on briefly is, so what happened to that $70 million that were authorized? The answer is that we only spent about $4 million of it doing preliminary design work in, in anticipation of the renovation and also doing a lot of the testing that ultimately revealed the presence of the PCBs and how widespread they were. So while obviously most of that design work doesn't translate very well to a new campus, some of it did, and particularly all of that testing and the, the PCB work was actually contributed a lot to the project we're doing right now. So we spent $4 million. The other $66 million of that authorization is not going to be exercised. We're not going to use it at all. Um, so some people have wondered, is this ballot question in November in addition to the $70 million? And the answer is no. We won't be paying repaying that $70 million, but for, except for the, the $4 million that we did spend. Um, so that brings us to the current project. And in short, um, and I think this is, we may have one next slide, go to the next slide if you don't mind. Thank you. There's a kind of timeline here uh, that talks about how we have reached this point where we're asking voters to authorize a bond. It began with a robust public engagement process in which uh, we talked to stakeholders, community members, students, staff of the buildings and so forth to identify what would be needed in a new high school, what attributes they wanted it to have. Our architects and our design team developed a series of concepts and ultimately the school board chose the concept that they felt best met student needs and was also the most fiscally responsible. It happened to be the least costly design option that we were presented with. Um, since then, additional design work has gone on at a more detailed level that allowed us to really with confidence estimate the cost of this new building. And that estimated cost um, is what has a, kind of brought us this point. So we got, got an estimated cost for the new building. I should say that the project as a whole in that estimate includes the remediation or kind of the cleanup 
of the PCBs in the old campus and then getting rid of all those old buildings. So that's a part of this total project cost. And, um, and at the same time, we have identified sources of funds to pay already to pay for a large portion of the project. So even though this project will in total cost uh, somewhat, you know, give or take probably a little around $200 million, we only need to borrow, we believe $165 million. And uh, to expand on that even further, we intend to continue to fundraise throughout the project. And we'll talk more about that perhaps tonight, but um, we are confident that in the end, we may not even need to borrow the full $165 million. But again, at this point, that's how much we would need to um, get approval for in order to move the project forward. And also having that approval, being able to show that the project's fully funding uh, funded could potentially make us eligible for other federal assistance. So the city council agreed to put the ballot item on the November ballot. That's kind of brought us to the point today where we are now traveling around the city to make sure people understand the question, what the question means and what the project would mean for Burlington. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to Joe White for a brief description of some of the current design from uh, the, the site and uh, and kind of some of the renderings, what the, what the building will look like. hub of student activity. Uh, there'll be a significant amount of seating uh, within uh, the, the student commons for dining uh, and gathering space and collaboration space uh, for the students. The cafeteria will be located on the first level of the common. There will be a 750 seat auditorium uh, with, with balcony and a three station gymnasium, uh, both of which will be accessed off the student commons. Uh, the third station of the gymnasium will actually have a retractable wall that can be closed off and will actually have a separate entrance uh, to the north parking area. And that uh, gym will serve as a community gym, uh, which can be closed off uh, from the remainder of the gymnasium and also from the school uh, so that it can be used by the community uh, during evening hours or, or weekend hours. Uh, we're also proposing a strong connection to the outdoors, which is something we heard loud and clear from both students uh, and teachers uh, at the schools. Uh, the, in addition to uh, maintaining and enhancing our connection to the arms forest uh, natural area to the north, uh, we're proposing to provide two outdoor learning areas. Uh, they're, they're, they're kind of, you can see them those circular uh, uh, drawings on both the east end of the building and the west end, these will be kind of smaller amphitheater style outdoor learning areas uh, where you know, classes can be held throughout the day, of course, during nice weather, probably not too many classes in the winter. Um, 
The building uh, and site are also being designed to be uh, highly energy efficient and sustainable. Uh, we will be pursuing a lead silver or better certification. Uh, fossil fuel free energy sources will be used, uh, including primary use of electricity with geothermal uh, heating and cooling and solar PV. The roof structure will be solar ready uh, for installation of solar units by a third party provider. Uh, that we're currently in conversations with. Uh, there will be generous natural light throughout the building. Uh, every classroom will have uh, windows. Uh, again, something we heard loud and clear from the students as something that's highly, highly desirable. Uh, durable, long-lasting, low-maintenance finishes will be used inside and out. And finally, there will be extensive bicycle connections and bike parking on the site and improved pedestrian access and uh, new walkways and paths. So if you can just kind of scroll through, we're going to throw a few, show a few renderings here. This is uh, the south facade of the building facing Institute Road. Uh, this is the north facade showing again the, the, the north entrance, which is very prominent with a lot of glass providing light into the student commons area. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a, just a, a typical classroom, again, with, with windows providing natural light. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this is a rendering of the student commons, the two level student commons. And as you can see, there's going to be plenty of, of seating for uh, students to you know, eat their lunch, uh, collaborate, work on projects. Uh, there's going to be stadium seating along the stairwell, again, for areas for students to uh, sit. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a rendering of the 750 seat auditorium or balcony. Uh, go ahead. And this is a rendering of the library, uh, library and media center. Again, with uh, you know a lot of glass offering natural light, uh, open floor plan, and plenty of spaces and stations for the the students to do their work. That might be it. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, so. Obviously, another natural question with this project is what does the cost mean to taxpayers? We've provided some estimates about the impact. It's important to note whenever we do tax estimates related to school spending that there are a lot of variables in the state's education funding formula. And we don't know how those variables will necessarily change from year to year. Spending is just one of the variables. Another variable is the number of students that we have attending the high school. And what's more, those students are given weights by the state. Um, that is, uh, just to go slightly off topic for a moment, that's a source of major accomplishment for your school board and for our community because the state has, uh, we passed legislation as a state that will update those weights in a way that is gonna better reflect the actual needs of those students. Uh, it's an area where historically Burlington and other communities that had a large number of traditionally marginalized students were being underweighted, which effectively meant that we were paying relatively more in taxes. It was more expensive, if you will, to, to serve those students than it was in, in other communities. So that's a major, major milestone. I didn't want to kind of overlook that tonight, even though it's not the main thrust of the, of the presentation. But I also want to point out that that's an example of one of those things that's going to be changing during the life of this project and exactly what impact that will have on our tax rates won't be known until it happens because it's enrollment based and that changes every year. Having said that, we still do try to provide some estimates to give people a flavor of what the impact will be. And when we do that, we essentially freeze all those other variables that we don't know how they'll change and we say, let's just assume they don't change for the sake of argument so that people can really understand the taxes vis-a-vis -vis what they're paying today. Um, once we fully bond for 165 million, we're estimating that will increase the education property tax rate by a little over 15%, as you can see on the slide. And we've done some estimates for what that would mean for a homeowner who pays uh, property taxes on a $370,000 home. And we've also estimated what that could mean for a taxpayer uh, what the increase could be for a taxpayer who's um, paying but receives a, an education uh, tax credit. Um, so on the next slide, you don't have to try to read this from your from your seats. Just know that it can be accessed online. We've put together a little bit of a chart 
that explains what the implication could be on property taxpayers for a range of different house site values. Uh, just today, in fact, I had a conversation, a consultation, I might call it, with uh, some uh, someone from the tax department because the next thing that we're trying to produce is kind of a similar chart that would apply to people who receive the education income tax credit. So we don't have that done yet, but that's in the works and we're hoping that that'll be published next week. Um, next slide, please, yeah. And uh, this chart, which again, is gonna ultimately start including information about income payers as well, or income-based payers, is intended to show that even with a full $165 million authorization, we're not gonna need to borrow or spend that money all at once. This is a multi-year project. Even the construction is gonna take place over a couple of years. So we have estimated the timing of when we will borrow the money. And the reason that's important is because every time we borrow the money, that is going to trigger obviously having to begin repaying those borrowed funds. And it's those repayments, the what's called the annual debt service that actually results in a budget increase and therefore impacts taxes. So as you can see from the slide up here, we are anticipating that borrowing probably to occur over three phases, which means that the increases in taxes associated with this project won't be felt all at once. We're not gonna go from zero to 165 and tax rates jump right up in one year. Rather, it will be phased in over a period of probably three, possibly even four years. So this chart is intended to show both the phasing in and also how toward the end of the borrowing period, as we retire some of that debt, that is to say we fully repay it, then the tax rate, relatively speaking, will, will decrease vis-a-vis -vis what it was when we were repaying the debt. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we're proud of in, in terms of what we've accomplished so far is the fact that we have identified a number of sources of funds to help reduce the cost to taxpayers already. I wanna emphasize that that work is not done. We're gonna to continue to do that work, not only through November, but even beyond November through the next legislative session, uh, pursuing existing programs. So we have every intent to identify as much money as possible so that even if we receive authorization to borrow $165 million, we hope not to do that because every dollar that we can uh, spend on this school that comes from something other than our, our bonding means that it's not coming from our local taxes. So having said that, to highlight some of the funds we've identified, we've identified $35 million of funds through various sources that we have access to already, including $5 million, an estimated that we can, we can save over the course of the next few years through uh, our careful budget management, $10 million of federal uh, ESSER money, which is money that is associated with uh, recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, $10 million that we're reallocating from our long-term capital plan to this project specifically. And uh, we also have $10 million from a congressional grant that we are putting toward relocating some of the tech center programs to the airport. Doing that, Doing that relocation reduces the size of the building on Institute Road. And when you reduce the size of the building on Institute Road, you reduce the cost of that building. So that was a major victory. It's also a very exciting opportunity to locate some of our really great BTC programs um, up at the airport doing cutting edge work and in collaboration with a really exciting, innovative partner in beta technologies. As I mentioned, we're continuing to or continue to pursue other funding sources. Uh, one thing that we are just starting to get off the ground is private fundraising from uh, kind of what you might traditionally think of fundraising, right? Looking for donors. So that that initiative is just being being launched and we're optimistic and you'll probably be hearing more about that in the near future. But our major uh, potential right now that we've identified in terms of fundraising is really through existing state and federal programs. Those programs do things like provide incentives related to building energy efficiency, the environmental condition of the building, the stormwater impact, uh, potentially cleaning up the PCBs. There's a lot of different opportunities there. and we're, we're trying to explore them all at the same time. And we have retained a professional firm to help us do that. Um, I guess the last thing I would say on the, the fundraising element that I think is worth really understanding is that some of those sources are going to take time to materialize because again these are programs that you have to apply for sometimes some of these programs that are relatively new such as parts of the uh, major federal infrastructure bill that you might have heard passed recently 
they don't even have the details of what the application process will look like yet. So we're optimistic that we'll be able to take advantage of those programs, but we're not even at a point where we can say, we know what the application looks like. So really, again, our commitment is not to let that fundraising effort drop even as we move forward with the, the construction, even if we get um, an approval to bond for the full 165 million. And I think we might have one more slide on timeline. Yep. So um, we've got some town halls coming up, one in September. Obviously, the November 8th bond vote, that's voting day. Um, folks here are probably pretty familiar with the fact that you can vote early in Vermont, but that's the last day that you can vote. Uh, if the bond passes, we expect to begin, or at least we hope to begin, tearing down the old buildings as early as possibly even late December, but certainly early in, in the, the winter in 2023. That is important because getting those buildings out of the way is what sets the stage for starting to do the new construction to follow. And if we have to wait and do some of that demolition in the warm months when, that are really more favorable to actually building something, then we could lose a significant amount of time because then we might have to wait through the winter to do some other construction. So, you know, it's not as simple as a project delay of one month necessarily means the whole thing just gets pushed back a month. It can be if you miss certain deadlines, there's big delays in the project. So that's why we're going to try to move very quickly if we get this authorization. Um, and ultimately, the target move in date to the new high school is in August 2025. We know that's an ambitious move-in date, but we've been assured by our design team that it's achievable, particularly if we hit some of the early milestones in the process. So we know it's asking a lot, but we also know that we have students right now who are in Macy's, uh, the former Macy's building, which is was a great emergency space, but is not, not a proper high school for our students. So we believe that it's critically important that we move this project as quickly as possible to uh, culminate in, in the new building and allowing it to open to students in, in August, 2025. So I think we'll stop there. And I don't know if there's statements or questions next. Questions? Do you wanna talk first? Um, there are just a couple of things I wanted to add, but I know that a lot of people who are here and people who might be on the Zoom have questions. Um, could you please go back to the first slide? So um, what came up for me, these are questions that I've continuously been getting from people across the city, not just here in um, our neighborhood. Um, so the original shutdown that happened was because of our renovation project, and we were required by state law to test for various toxins. At the time, the Vermont Department of Health had what was seen as a really conservative threshold, but a necessary threshold for safety to measure how many PCBs were airborne. So that was where it started. And that got us kind of on the radar um, of the federal EPA to say what's actually going on here. And that's when we learned that we had really high amounts of PCBs um, significantly in building F, which I think was the former tech center, but all over the high school. And that they were not just airborne, that they were deep in the concrete, in the masonry, in the windows. So this is really important because the question comes up, why are you not just remediating? Why not just change out the windows? Why not change out the floors? And I think that Nathan spoke to that because it's just not feasible to do it without having a building that's not totally PCB free. And it would be super expensive. I would add to that, that along the way in the past couple of years, the state changed its threshold and they made it more specific to uh, kindergarten age and then I think elementary school and then high school and what acceptable levels would be. But regardless, the levels are still way too high in the current building. So even though they changed the levels, which muddied things a bit for us on the school board, um, it didn't actually change the situation, which is that the school is silly with these PCBs, which can cause a host of health problems, in particular um, neurotoxological effects on children. So we really need to consider that when we think about like, why are we going for the school? The last thing I'll say on that topic is um, maybe you can help me talk about this a little bit. Uh, people have asked me then about the soil. 
So why are we building on the same site? And we went through a whole process of looking at many different sites and saying, well, we own this property and it's the best site. And the site where the athletic fields currently are, where we have the track, was considered, but was not considered a good site because of the um, existing soils there. If I remember correctly, they're not very stable. They're, just, they're very sandy, right? So it's really yeah, so that, that was not a good option to have a school built there. Um, and there is some kind of funky topography on the side of Institute Road where we've decided to rebuild, but it's the best site that we have. And the design that we chose after we demolish the school will allow for containment of the PCB. So that idea of a super fun site rather than dredge things up and release the toxins, we remove the school and then we cover the site with the parking lot and the existing building so that those things are not then coming back up and affecting the school. Joe White, <laughs> will you please confirm that what I said is true? Uh, I don't know if I can confirm that, but yeah. uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the soils that are contaminated with the PCBs, those will need to be removed. Yeah. Uh, and they'll have to go to a certified landfill. Uh, the other types of contaminated soils are, are what are known as urban soils. And, you know, those are just, uh, you know, soils that are contaminated from being in a city with industrial air pollution that settles there over time. Uh, it, those soils can be relocated on the site and capped with a, with a paved parking lot or, or building or something like that. Uh, but the PCB soils will need to be um, and when you said funky stuff, I think you meant the ledge more about the top. You were talking about the soils. Yeah, I just let's define funky. It has more about the the positioning of the school is avoiding the bedrock ledge. Yeah, also be incredibly expensive to yeah. right. That's exactly what I meant. There's rock. And there's also sand, and there's yeah. also there used to be a dairy farm. So there's all right. kinds of stuff happening on that site, and there's an ill, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just one last thing that I think is noteworthy. Uh, a lot of times in these projects, people are concerned about their students' ability to access extracurricular activities. And one thing here that will not change is the access to the athletic field. So even though students are still at downtown VHS for classes, they will be able to continue to do sports, which I think is hugely important and became a very important theme in the pandemic. So I'll stop there. I just want to add that the school board is really committed to vetting all of these decisions and, and all of the different options. I, I feel really good about the work that we've done and feel incredibly, you know, the information that we're getting feels very thorough. Um, of the priorities, Timeliness, I think, is probably at the top of the list because of the, the student experience. Um, part of why this has been such a difficult, uh, why it's been such an emotionally charged situation is because the kids were learning remotely and were about to go back to school when the school was shut down, when they were, when, and they had to go back to remote learning. So super unfortunate. Um, Macy's might be one of the most out of the box funky things, but that's not necessarily fun. It's it's the best case scenario of a lot of not great scenarios. So the sooner we can get them in a new building, the better. And it being cost effective is is really the second um, the second priority. And of course. We are so committed to doing it right the first time. Um, speaking about the durability of the material, the idea is this building is going to be, it's just sturdy. I don't know what other word to say, but 50 years from now, there's not going to be the kinds of deterioration or scenarios in which oh, we have to sink another $500,000 into it. That should not be happening with the choices that we're making. Questions and answers now? Um, do, do people come up to a mic or run them to the
very much. Hi there, I'm just making sure this is on. Charlie, can you hear me? The, um, I'm Brian Pine, I live on Crowley Street. I serve as the city's um, CEDO director. But my question is two things. Please avoid using the word Superfund site in relation to this property, because it's really a totally different characterization than a brownfield. And I don't believe Superfund would be what EPA would call the high school site. Despite the contamination, it's important to know there's a difference, a pretty big, pretty big difference. So um, I just want to know who analyzed the cost benefit analysis of the geothermal versus sticking with the wood fired plant that is on the property now and I think has quite a life left in it. So I'm just wondering about the cost effectiveness of that strategy. I can uh, kind of answer that question. Uh, the design team would be better suited to answer it, but we do have a mechanical engineer who is running uh, energy modeling uh, on the new building. And we've had you know, a geothermal test wells, uh, borings on the site, which shows that there's there's good uh, opportunity for geothermal. Uh, but I guess their their modeling has shown that it would be much more efficient to um, run the heating and cooling system with the geothermal system uh, because the existing wood chip plant, I guess, is oversized. Uh, it's um, because it was designed for a very inefficient building. <laughs> uh, so uh, my understanding is that uh, because it is oversized, it would be very inefficient uh, to use that as the heating store. Um, and I guess the cost, I, I, don't, I don't know if the, what the cost would be to downsize it, but uh, their determination so far has been that uh, it would not be cost effective. To continue to use it, they, they are still uh, evaluating it though as to whether or not they could uh, continue to use it as a backup system. Just to add one other element to that response, it's a good question, and, and it's um, it's a good point that that wood chip boiler system that we have still has life left in it, right? It's not; um, it was built much more recently. Um, Joe talked about kind of the fact that it. Even though it's more uh, more recently built, it was built to support a very inefficient high school. And that's one of the kind of interesting parts of this whole process is that when you build a new building, you don't just get the benefit of it being new. You get the benefit of all, all of the efficiency progress that we have made in the decades since the building was built, as well as simply a more compact design that lends itself inherently to more efficiency. So we don't we won't necessarily need as much of that heating. The other thing um, that that's uh, important to understand about that is that, and I think um, folks in here, some people may be familiar with the city having a target of a, a, a kind of net zero 2030 target. And so while this building won't be commissioned in 2030, and, and in that sense, won't be fully net zero when it opens in all likelihood, although it's still possible, um, the wood chips are energy that comes from off the site. And so uh, the idea of being net zero is like you're generating the energy that you use in the, in the building. And so that's one of those examples where by going to geothermal, we also um, are better able to comply with the net 30 kind of approach to generate as much of the energy for the building on site. And, um, and we're certainly going to be working, working closer to the BED for incentives and other Burlington Electric that is for incentives and other opportunities to um, make efficiency investments in the building. Uh, thank you. I, I actually wanted to follow up with that. Um, it's, it's interesting that that's so rebuilt because that seems like a pretty good opportunity for district heating. You know, you've got Rock Point, the Alliance Church, the Moose, you know, that Moose Lodge. You know, they're looking at it for the Media Medical Center with the ramp plan. That's something that might be kind of interesting because there's a lot of a lot of talk now around the country about district heating. Uh, it's big in Europe, and you know, if it's oversized, that actually might be a great opportunity. Um, as far as the geothermal, 
you know, I've been involved with the, the Sustainability Academy. It has a beautiful geothermal system there, but nobody seems to have a handle on it. Does it save them much or anything? You know, it's something that's been asked of EED and others, but it'd be great to, to calibrate with that site. You know, it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be great because, you know, especially with Champlain College, they have a little different geothermal system. They are doing very well. So it'd be it'd be kind of good not to just model, but to bring in some calibration because that's something we typically don't see on these large projects, and and we don't see much follow up. So that I mean that's uh, a big cost, obviously, and especially on the operating moving down the road. Um, the community general idea is good. I mean, you know, we're asking a lot from the community, you know, to support the school. I feel very strongly we need it. This should be a crown jewel of our community. It's our future, our kids. Um, and you know, part of it is to not be isolated, right? From the so I I that came out of the blue from what I've seen before, and that's great. I, I really appreciate that. And also on the you know, kind of the super fun site, yeah, definitely <laughs> we want to be very precise with terms on that. Um, however, we should look to see what's happening in the city here because. Sometimes even super fun sites that are capped and intended to never use again, people look to do things on them. So I know, you know, we, there's been talk in the past of having different maintenance and other offices on that building. So if the soil is capped, make sure that it's in a spot that will never be developed or can't be developed. I'll bring that up. Thank you. And before we continue, I would like to apologize for the names of my students. I'm not an expert. And I was attempting to make an analogy, not to characterize the site in that way, or to say that I have talked to any experts who had characterized the site in that way, but to say that there is a lot of concern in the community about our decision to build a new school on top of a place that has been shut down because of toxins. So my idea was an attempt at putting people at ease, but I do understand that words have power and that they are quotable and that that's a very strong word and a different classification than what I was talking about. So it was not my intention to complicate things by saying that, but to more put people at ease about this massive construction project we are trying to get together on behalf of us. And speaking of, um, part of the urgency is to be able to demolish and remove and remediate uh, with students not on the campus, I didn't, I'm sure everybody knows when is going through this, what looks like a fantastic um, addition, project, uh, renovation, actually a combination of all those things, while the students are in other classes. It's noisy. Also, they're in one class, maybe for six months. I, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know some students are in have been in different classes, classrooms, and they've had to move. It's very disruptive. Obviously, we don't want our students around toxins that might become, well, I'm, I am positive that there's tons of regulations around a construction site with PCBs. But the further away the students can be while that happens, the better. And the sooner we can have them on. So I I want to also point out the, the 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 bond S the language needs to be decided first by the board, then by the city council. Both have. I did you guys have a unanimous vote? Great. So did the sort of the school board to uh, approve approving the language that goes on the bond. But that happened. When did that happen, Joe, for city council? No, Two weeks? Yeah. So, but that's for November. So this is why fundraising is going to happen, grant writing, grants are being um, researched, all that stuff is going to happen 
from now until the end of the project, maybe even after. And, but there's no way we can responsibly begin to enter into contracts with these humongous entities, right? And not really actually have the money secured. Um, as much as I think a lot of people do great things by putting the cart for the horse, that does not seem like good practice right now. So we have to ask for what we actually might need. Uh, so seeing that there are no more questions, I thought I might just close. Uh, I know we don't have any. So, oh, there's, there is another question. Sorry, I'm doing um, kitchen cleanup, so I'm trying to do both things. I'm just curious, it's a little out there, but would it be possible for um, BED to own improvements like the energy systems, and that way they keep on firm and rate payers would pay it, which is a broader um, group of contributors? Um, so they could own the, the geothermal, they could own everything that's related that you can package. This happens on Wall Street, by the way. You can package everything, you can package the thermal envelope. And they would own that and lease it to the district. We can certainly uh, we can certainly ask them about that. It's a great idea. They we've already had a preliminary conversation with them. They didn't bring that up specifically. It doesn't I mean obviously they, they can't go back and ask them. They may they may have the capacity to do that or not, but it's a good um, question. I think they have already committed to generating kind of a, a comprehensive list of all the incentives that they can offer for the project. That's obviously different than what you're talking about, but I, I'm not sure you were, you may have been in the kitchen when we mentioned that. Um, I will just say it's a cautionary note um, that I think that's one of those, those ideas that like, even if we were to pursue it, um, that would, that might add, that might be, that might take a significant amount of time to get there because in order for the uh, electric department to potentially bond for that, they probably have to go back to the voters as well. So that could add, you know, it's certainly worth like figuring out. I just, it made, that was my immediate reaction to that was like, we wouldn't, we would still want to go forward with obviously our $165 million ask um, just in terms of making sure that the project can move forward, even if we continue to kind of explore that, that idea. Right, or could you do a joint bond question so that there's authority? To happen either way. We couldn't do again, we couldn't do it at this point because the deadline to submit the language for the November ballot due to early voting is passed. So that, that would have to be like a future so like maybe question. Potentially, if there yeah, was I mean, an avenue for it. Like, I know there's like a business as usual kind of thing where you're like you don't have enough time, but given the magnitude, given the scale of this and how most people don't pay attention until October 30th. <laughs> and then they look at this number and they're just like, no way. So I would just encourage for the district and our our kids benefit, you know, that 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 might take too much time. It's just kind of a business as usual answer. Not, and you know, not um, and that we I don't think we can afford that. I think ideas have to be brought forth at an accelerated pace, even if they're crazy, and get people on them, you know. <laughs> To really research, it's it's a thing. There's firms that do this. They package it, and you know people benefit in many ways. So, yeah, thanks. absolutely. No, I appreciate the idea. This is a good one, and something that I'm happy to to bring to BD's attention. Um, and I think you know one thing that Liz mentioned, I think, is worth closing on just in in brief is uh, because I, I see we don't, I believe, have any uh, students or oh, we have another question. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> wanted to elevate you know I really appreciate all the work y'all done and the concern and, and the need for a um to you know have this move along at a clip um but with the kind of education and awareness piece I was wondering like, what are you sensing from the community at large and and what kind of you know programs and you know communication and and actually I think, you know, this is supposed to be representative, you know, community, different community representatives and organizations. What do you need from community groups and from institutions in, in order to support, you know, a passage or is, or you're getting positive responses, but mainly like, what do you need from institutions and from community folks right now? Uh, 
have no, we have not an authority that this kind of ties into what I wanted to say, and I'm, I'm sure that people here would like to weigh in too. Uh, my sense is that we're in a crisis situation. We need badly need a new high school and tech center. And that kind of by default puts people in favor of it, even if they're holding their breath and feeling really panicked at the prospect of yet another increase in their taxes. Think they can understand why and why it is needed. So for me, it is people need to vote yes to get the project moving. But then to your question about community involvement, we really need help with getting that money back through different sources, through different avenues, in order not to have to have a $165 million bond. So it's kind of it's kind of inverted. Yes, time is of the essence, and I think we're all going to be knocking on doors and going to meetings and trying to encourage people to ask questions and get support before they vote or before November 8th. But then after that, it is critical in order for us to actually save money for taxpayers to find different avenues for us to get money for the PCB remediation. There's been money approved by the state, $20 million initially. That is money for the entire state because they acknowledge that there are PCBs not just in Burlington, but in many other schools. But we have yet to learn how we can access some of that money to go towards remediation. So that kind of thing. To, to put together the really bright, community-involved, engaged people of Burlington toward efforts to not have to end up actually having $165 million to pay back out of our taxes. Those are my thoughts on it. I think the first thing that came to mind was just a lot of folks are, well, we're, we're aware that Vermont is one of the states that doesn't have this thing called construction aid for yeah for educational purposes and I look back at how many maintenance type things were deferred and how the building kind of or the buildings ended up in in such a, a poor state and I, I I mean I really don't know what it has meant over the past five decades to not have had that kind of have a fund to be able to do routine maintenance or no not routine maintenance that would be more like emergency necessary I don't actually you know not having construction aid I don't know a lot about it <laughs> um so it's hard to tell but that is something that I I know that our our representatives state and house representatives are advocating for that it, it's totally prudent but that is definitely a way that our community members can become civically engaged and let it be known. You cannot tell all you know schools to operate in such a way and be able to provide programs when their roof is leaking. It's just really hard. You know, I think about even my own state of what I want to focus on as a commissioner. We have to be all hands on deck right now when it comes to passing this bond and, support, and letting people know just, yeah, we are in a crisis. We need for this to happen. We need voters to support the bond. And I want it, I want that to happen so that I can go and do the other work, which is about actually, you know, serving students and programming. And, and maybe that actually means revising a policy about something that I really hope is gonna come down to a meaningful, experience for our students so said vote yes so we can get back to doing the, the, the real work which is figuring out how to educate and serve our students better we might have another question here with the microphone hello hi um in addition to the items that you mentioned in terms of seeking additional funding from a variety of other sources, is there any particular plan to go to create some kind of an endowment and see if we can get uh, private contributions? Um, so those individuals 
that may be able to uh, donate to the school? Um, is there, you know, thinking of UVM and, and what they do in terms of keeping track of their alumni? I know I get that special letter and envelope every so often. Uh, do we do anything like that with the high school? You know, maybe some adult alumni might consider um, if they were reached out to, you know, making some kind of donation and supplementing the uh, the need that way. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe, and I apologize if I wasn't clear enough when I talked about the fundraising, but um, yes, yeah, so we are just, we, we actually just recently announced a partnership with um, the Burlington Students Foundation um, and it aimed at doing exactly that. So those efforts are are just kind of in their infancy and just just launching. We've we've invested more time and energy in some of those big federal programmatic approaches to to raising other funds, but definitely that's a piece of that total portfolio. And um, you know, hindsight being what it is, sure, we would love to have said 20 years ago we started ambitiously track keeping track of all the graduates and we know how to reach them and we could do exactly what UVM and, and every other major. Uh, college and university across the country does. We don't have that. So we are kind of building it from scratch on the fly. But um, I think I think we'll still have some measure of success, particularly because it's no secret to people who are still in and around Burlington what, what's going on here. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we will generate um, some real excitement around that effort, even if it doesn't, uh, in terms of like the total fi financial contribution, even if it doesn't match some of those the potential in those federal programs, I think will be meaningful for people. And there are going to be opportunities, big and small too. I mean, there's ways that we're talking about to allow people, certainly anyone can make a donation, but you know, simple things um, that you can do that are entice people. Like uh, it can be, you know, having your little name on, uh, as we've done, like in, in um, Contois and, you know, having your name or your organization's name on the back of a, an auditorium seat or something like that. Doesn't mean you're donating millions of dollars if that's not within your means, uh, but it gives people a chance to, to do something and be part of that, the legacy of the building. I have one more thing. Um, I've heard a lot about the long-term financial implications in terms of this bond, which is kind of a negative view of it. I'd like to, to take that and flip it and say, this is a long-term financial investment in our city that people are leaving and have left. Personally, no people who have left because we don't have a high school and people are not coming. And that also has long-term financial implications. And it also makes us impoverished as a community because we don't get new people who are, I think, the lifeblood of keeping us going. So there's a lot of research about building schools and people saying, wow, that's where I want to live. And I think that a lot of us here feel that way already about Burlington, but it would be great if we could get this and be really proud of it and give it to our community and also then bring new people in to continue to thrive. So not so much implications, but investment. How are we making a significant, powerful, long-term investment in our city? And I think it really is with this bond. Hey, well, just, just to uh, close, I wanted to highlight um, for folks, because this wouldn't be obvious uh, from our presentation, I think, but just how valuable not just generally the public input has been in the design process, but in particular, some of the input we've received from students. Uh, we're really intentional about making sure that we created opportunities for some authentic conversations with, with students in the process. And I think you can see a lot of their ideas and uh, things that they supported in this design, the abundance of natural light, particularly in the classrooms, the connection to the outdoors that Joe mentioned and having outdoor classroom spaces and being able to make use of the whole campus um, as is something important. That student commons idea, we heard a lot from students that they wanted opportunities to meet with each other and collaborate that were outside of the structured classroom setting. So I think for those who here uh, maybe have a student who will eventually attend, or if you're watching at home and you're wondering um, kind of how we are trying to translate what students are saying into the design of the building. 
you can know that we have been intentional about doing that. And I think what we've received from students has been really great feedback and has made this a much better and more exciting design. So I think that's just worth worth calling out, um, easy to overlook in this process and, and something that was, I think, for me at least, a really powerful experience. So wanted to share that with the group. Otherwise, I think we can say thanks everyone for being here or, or attending virtually. And certainly if you have any other questions, um, we have a website where you can find information and you can write to us. We're happy to, to respond. Uh, your school commissioners, I know, love, love getting questions. So I'm sure you know how to reach them. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for having us. All right. Thank you. Um, where? Let's see. It's almost eight. Um, Jamie and Polly, did you have any other like school commission updates other than what was yeah. part of this? Um, um, only that the start of the school year has been great. It has been great to come in without masks. And we're hearing really good things from the classrooms. They did a lot of work at the downtown VHS this summer. Noise mitigation is happening. It's really not as bad as it has been. Um, sports are up and running. Musicals, elementary schools are doing well. There's just a lot of good happy news from across the district about the start of the school year. I just want to put a plug in for uh, you know, we're still looking for paraeducators, especially paraeducators. And I I know that the requirements or job qualifications, wherever you want to put it, I I know that it's a minimum of two years of college or a certain amount of credits, but there is also a test that people can take. So for those that are interested in and in, in possibly dismiss the idea of applying thinking, oh, I, I don't have an associate's degree or I haven't gone to college yet, there might be another way to get um, uh, experience, uh, what do they call it when you create school credit like experience or work experience? There's, there's, other, there's alternative ways to qualify. And um, it, I think it's just not as well known as it should be. We're trying to get better about getting that message out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you want to Sure, I can go and one of his Emma. Sure, yeah. Your turn. Would you like to go now or? Uh, sure. Either way. Why don't you go first? Because I have to write the map on the cover. I want to get it right. Okay. Sure. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't have too, too many updates tonight, but I'm happy to answer questions that folks have. Uh, I know it's been a while since we've had an MPA meeting. So um, I have an update related to uh, the city's efforts to um, get cannabis, uh, retail cannabis licenses issued. Uh, at our August 15th meeting, we uh, passed a uh, resolution establishing a local cannabis control board. Um, the state is going to be issuing retail cannabis licenses as soon as October 1st. So um, there's really an effort on the part of the city to have our process in place so that we can um, uh, be ready to meet those deadlines. Um, and, you know, the businesses that are more or less ready to open, we'll be able to apply for licenses soon. I think the city will have that application open um, in the coming weeks. The license committee will be meeting September 14th to uh, review some of those. So that uh, will be happening soon and would encourage folks to check out that meeting. That'll be the first sort of 
meeting where they're looking at those uh, licenses for a few retail businesses that are planning to open in Burlington um, in the next month or so. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to talk about some efforts that I've been working on with other counselors and members of the Board of Health around gun violence prevention. Um, I know the Board of Health, I think, met this evening. Uh, they're going to be talking about uh, some efforts that we can undertake as a city to um, put gun violence prevention front and center for our community. Um, you know, efforts that we can uh, ask for the legislature to look into. And along those lines, I've been meeting with some of our uh, Burlington delegation to, to discuss those efforts as well. Um, I think, you know, we all are uh, pretty shocked at the increase in uh, gun violence that we've seen over the last couple of years. And um, we really need to be pursuing more prevention efforts. It's tragic that it has gotten to the level that it has, and we should have been doing more before now, before it got to this point. Um, but, you know, I'm committed to pursuing prevention efforts now and um, really building community around this and getting people involved in that. So to the extent that folks wanna be involved in those efforts, uh, I think hopefully we'll be seeing a plan come to the council from the Board of Health at some point um, and look forward to engaging with folks on that. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is I've reached out to the MPA about having a community meeting uh, regarding some of the rodent issues that we've had in the western part of the Old North End. Uh, I know that many folks have been dealing with that, uh, and then it's an ongoing issue, and then we want to make sure that um, this doesn't spread beyond uh, what we've seen already. So uh, to the extent that folks are dealing with those issues and um, need assistance from the city, I know Director Ward and permitting inspections have been on top of that. Uh, the Board of Health has also discussed it. So um, there are resources available. Uh, if folks have any questions about that, please reach out. So happy to answer any other questions that folks have, but uh, otherwise we're gonna cede the floor to either Jean or uh, Emma. Jean? Any questions that you got there, Joe? Is anybody I'm, I'm being on Zoom here kind of hard to see? I think you're good to go. Okay, I um, I want to use this as just an an intro to an item that I hope that we can have a a, a special agenda item um, in October or November, which is all legal resident voting uh, in local elections. Um, if some of you may recall that Montpelier and Winooski have um, opened up the right to vote uh, in local elections to any resident that is a legal resident of the city legal and legally residing in the United States, uh, regardless of whether they are a citizen or not. And uh, the Charter Change Committee of which I chair um, has been um, looking at the, um, the work that both Winooski and Montpelier have done and um, have prepared a, um, a charter change that we are hoping to bring forward to the uh, council to vote on, to put it on the March ballot. Um, there'll be, there, there's actually one other one that we're still working on uh, relating to the siting of polling places, but um, what we're engaged in right now is a community engagement process to talk to people about the details of um, all legal resident voting in local elections and uh, get feedback, get questions. We're reaching out to the, um, uh, the trusted community voices and the advisory committee for uh, new Americans and uh, other NPAs and everywhere that we possibly can. So um, I am sort of making this um, a foray into the NPA as part of our engagement process. And rather than go on and on, um, I can just sort of leave it there and see if there's anybody that has um, any questions about that right off, off the bat.
and uh, I guess I'm not seeing or hearing any, and that I'll take that as a positive sign. Uh, just, to, just to, and so far we've we've been to and talked with all of the um, elected ward um, election officials, the ward clerks, and the um, inspectors of election. We've uh, talked with the board of voter registration. We're working with the mayor um, and the city manager in uh, Winooski and in Montpelier and uh, of course, working very closely with our own uh, city clerk's office who is uh, in charge of sort of coordinating and running local elections. And um, what I can tell you is that I, we have not heard any opposition to this. We've gotten some great questions in terms of how the logistics are gonna work, but it's very heartening. And uh, for those of you who want to see a full-throated um, um, endorsement of the uh, uh, of this item. Uh, you can try to dig back, or I can send you my uh, uh, North Avenue knows um, councilor corner piece, where I, I try to make that uh, the uh, that that pitch. So that that's the main thing that I wanted to talk about. And uh, um, thanks. I'll turn it over to Emma then. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm State Representative Emma Mulvaney Stanick. I represent what is now called Chittenden 17, which is the basically from Park Street over to the lake and then all the way up to Ethan Allen. Um, uh, Ethan Allen, sorry, I've had a very long work day. Homestead, although there's a couple of blocks across the way, and then also up to Letty Park. Um, so I, it's as everyone probably knows, it's the off session for the legislature. Uh, so it's a bit of a quiet time. However, it's never really quiet when it comes to state policy, what happens with the administration or a lack thereof. Uh, and it's a little hard in the design of the Vermont legislature because when we're off session, those of us who have to work for a living go off to our other jobs and to stay on top of and, and uh, really monitor what's happening is somewhat difficult. And I use that as a lead in because I wanted to make sure, and I was trying to search on my phone, although. I forgot you can't get really good cell coverage here in, the, in this space, but I did find the email at least. I wanted to make sure folks, because uh, a lot of Vermonters, there's probably at least a couple thousand Vermonters who've been using the VRAP program since COVID relief funds have been available. That's the rental assistance program. There's a companion program that's also available for utility bill assistance. So as you might have seen in the, in the media, um, and it's, it's really concerning because out of it felt really out of nowhere without a lot of communication at all from the governor. Um, the, the program is going to abruptly end for any new applications on October 1st for rental assistance. This is a little bit of because money was not, they were not on top of how much money was going out. Obviously there's all a huge economic need. We know this here in, in Chittenden County slash Burlington with so much, um, uh, so much spiking in rental rates, let alone people still recovering from uh, COVID and the pandemic and the impact on our economy. So it's quite upsetting. I wanna make sure people know that. I do not think that is being communicated well to folks on the program who, who, or who might wanna still access the program. But I wanna be clear, the VRAP program is gonna stop taking new applications for rent and other expenses related to housing by on October 1st, which is really in just two weeks. The utility applications will continue through December 31st, um, but essentially this is because they've run out of money. Um, so the, again, the problem here is that structurally we don't meet as a legislature until January. So even if the governor proposes in his budget or we wanna propose in the actual budget, additions, there's going to be a gap and that's a problem. And I want to make sure people are aware of that. So if people have any, um, and the other piece I want to say is that any participant in the program right now who receives section eight will also no longer be eligible for assistance. I think this has a, a dramatic impact on especially folks in our neighborhood. Um, and again, our hands are a bit tied as legislators to respond to this until January. So I wanted to put up a big flag. If people have questions, I'm happy to um, help folks as much as I can outside this meeting. So that's the first one. Um, and the second piece is, so as I said, we're not in session, but this is the time to start thinking about legislation to put forward. I've talked a bit in last session, or last MPAs around my intention to advance gun policy and some abortion rights issues outside of Article 22, which is on the um, general election ballot that will change the constitution for reproductive liberty. There's more that could be done. Tonight, I just wanted to flag that um, 
folks who might know me know I've spent a lot of years of my life in the labor movement. I try to also advance labor bills. And so this year I'm working with um, a couple of uh, organizations to put a bill in around just cause employment rights. That's different than just cause eviction rights. Uh, so similar concept though, where folks who, because most Vermonters work as at-will employees in the state of Vermont, because they do not benefit from having a union. Um, and so they can essentially be terminated. Their job, they could be fired for pretty much any reason. And even though we have job discrimination laws on the books in Vermont around gender, racial identity, et cetera, it is tremendously difficult to prove that. Um, and there's a thousand and one reasons why an employer can just decide to terminate you. So this seems uh, like a very important piece around power dynamics and making sure that Vermonters are protected in their place of employment. Um, and to really make it a, 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 a a pretty clear bill about what we mean around the good, what are the good cause reasons for someone to be terminated. So that'll, that'll be a bill I'll be advancing. And the second one related to labor, I have many others because this is my, my main area, but I'll be putting forward with uh, Representative Brian Sheena, a labor omnibus bill, which is a fancy word for miscellaneous bill uh, to further add more labor rights for workers. And that would include things like um, making it easier to organize unions. So there's a thing called car check. I won't go into the details, but majority, majority um, sign up is another way to describe it. It would take one step out of the unionization process. And if anyone's been watching Starbucks and Amazon and other entities, uh, that's actually the on the, uh, the federal level, but similar process. There's these steps and every step takes time, which is more time for employers to intimidate workers and to hold things like captive audience meetings, et cetera. And that's another piece among this sort of multi-pronged bill to look at trying to really um, empower workers so that they, that when you go to your workplace, um, there is not a power indifference, which can really uh, harm you economically if you decide to organize a union or want to stand up for yourself or there's, there's health and safety issues, whatever that might be. So more to come, but I thought I would, as I was driving here from another meeting, I thought that was would be the things I would try to mention. And I'm happy to answer questions on that or other things. I was very surprised when I found out that our tip minimum wage is basically a vestige of Jim Crow that's still kind of hanging out here in 2022. So I don't know if they have an update on that, but I was I was very curious about that. They want to bore people to tears, but that is also one of the issues that I'll put in this omnibus bill. Because great point, Chris, because I think a lot of folks, especially white folks, don't understand the history of a lot of these um, uh, bifurcated uh, pieces of economic policy that have built, been built intentionally. And even here in Vermont, in many states still have this uh, sub-tiered minimum wage for tip workers. And so that means that in Vermont, even though our minimum wage is, don't quote me, is $10, $11, whatever it is, an hour at this point, tip workers, it's half of that. And in theory, you're supposed to make that up every week by the tips you are receiving, but that's a funky process at best for anyone who's worked in a industry where tips are a regular thing. So eliminating that has has been something a handful of states have done. I think that is absolutely something we should pursue. And I didn't introduce the bill last session, but I will be this session on that issue. Well, because of racism and sexism. Just those little things. I'll be dismantling that next session, yes. Um, thanks, Emma. I wanted to come back to the Vermont Rental Assistance Program. Um, there's a Spanish speaking custodian who speaks very little English, who I try to help with certain tech things and bureaucratic things, who showed me that she had received an email the other day. And it's really long and I, I didn't have time in that moment. And I don't I don't speak Spanish. So to help her, but I was wondering what are the steps for new Americans and non-English speaking people to understand that this benefit is coming to an end? And 
are there organizations specifically where they could go? Like someone said to me, maybe migrant justice for this particular person. Um, is the Association of Africans Living in Vermont a place that people from that part of the world could go to who are living here? What are the steps people could take to better understand how that has changed and how they might access other benefits if there are any at all? That is a great question. And I don't think they honestly have that in place yet. So at various points, I'll double check, of course, um, but at various points along the way, technical support in the sense of um, having folks who are speak the language folks um, need or just accessibility in general, because as you said, the state communicates often in long text, which even if English is your primary language is hard to navigate period and understand and then navigate deadlines with everything else we try to um, handle. So VRAP um, has been run by the Vermont State Housing Authority, um, but I know there's been a lot of partners along the way and I just I'm not sure in terms of language access and accessibility uh, throughout the last two years of COVID on a, all these types of programs, I'm not sure if they're at the table because obviously they should be compensated and need to be compensated. But with this fast change, I'm not sure that those technical services are online and and communicating as they need to. So that is what a few of us legislators are trying to jump on top of since this news was less than a week old of all these gaps, right? So people aren't um, uh, literally left out in the cold, which I fear is what we're really headed towards. So that's a great question. I will follow up if you want to Thank you. It's nice to be in her in person. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Miami, Miami, go ahead with your question. Sorry. Um, my question was just about so everybody on Section 8 can no longer get help from VRAP. Let me just look back at the ex exact email. It says participants who receive rental assistance, such as Section 8, will no longer be eligible for assistance. And I'm uh, connecting the dots here. Uh, as of October 1st, um, the program. You know what? I don't know who's asking that question. Let me double check because they don't finish that thought here in the list of changes that are happening. I don't want to provide misinformation about that, but they do clearly say that rental assistance is no longer, if you're on Section 8, is no longer, um, you will no longer be eligible for assistance. And I just need to know what the drop date is on that. Do you know, can you tell me your name so I can follow up with you? Mayumi. to walk around and ask my question like an MC work in the room but uh now I'll go back to my seat yeah I just wanted to follow up with y'all from the council um as y'all know I, I live and recently appointed to the marketplace commission thank you guys um one of the things I'm sure you're all aware of that we've seen a lot of in downtown recently is the, the gun violence issue and I don't think it takes a PhD in criminology to take a walk through City Hall Park and see that there's some questionable activity going on, to say the least. And with the advent of the Shelter Pod Village, which I think is moving along steadily, uh, I'm wondering if we're going to see a transition plan to move folks out of the park uh, and into the Shelter Pod Village. Um, I think there's the concern not only from residents um, regarding the activities going on there, but certainly we're seeing a bit of a spillover effect um, on the marketplace um, and it's, you know, it's creating issues. So I'm just wondering, you know, what the plan is for dealing with the, the many challenges uh, posed by the current environment in, in City Hall Park. Um, and for the record, I had asked Director White at one of the mayor's coffee and uh, she declined to to elaborate. Uh, asked who? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, I think um, 
we're dealing with a lot of overlapping challenges right now and it's whether it's related to the housing crisis mental health crisis uh substance use and overdose um you know the shelter pod community on elmwood ave is going to help alleviate some of those issues it's going to help with uh there'll be 35 beds there cvoeo will be helping provide services to folks who are living there um you know cvoeo howard street outreach uh, the csl teams have been communicating with um folks who are experiencing houselessness who are currently sheltering outside so um you know i think in the coming weeks we'll have a little bit more to say about uh, what the plan will be for helping folks uh, access um, housing through the shelter pod community. You know, I think this is really going to take partnerships with folks in, in state government, city government, because the shelter pod community is not going to be the end all be all solution for us here. Um, and so, you know, to that end, I have been working with um, other folks on whether it's, you know, I met with the street outreach team the other day. Um, we're working on the crisis response team, which hopefully will be uh, up and running in the next couple of months. Uh, I've been pushing the administration to give us an update on that. Uh, hopefully we'll see something in one of our next council meetings here. Um, and then the other piece of this is, you know, advocating for overdose prevention sites and other harm reduction measures, because, you know, I think we had somebody who had a fatal overdose in City Hall Park uh, just the other day. So, um, you know, there are a lot of pressing needs that um, we're working to address. Some of those solutions are already in the works, um, but, you know, we have a long way to go. Am I good? Okay, good. Yeah, I think for me, it's a, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, the addiction and the unhousedness situation. I think for me, it's, it's a little bit more basic for that. It's basically for me, boils down to common courtesy and mutual respect. And I, I kind of look back, you know, when we're all yay tall, you know, what our parents taught us. I know that we got people out here that are parents and raise kids and some of us, maybe not, but, um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, what we taught your kid, basic morality, basic right from wrong. And it was typically something along the lines of don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, and don't kill. And I think for those of us who live in downtown and who are trying to, you know, operate establishments in that area, I think the issue for us is just the lack of basic common courtesy and respect. And it's the behavior by folks who fall into any one of those other categories. Um, but it, from my perspective, it seems, I think we're all, we can recognize that, you know, addiction is very clearly a medical issue. It needs to be treated as such, but if a person is service resistant and engaging behavior that infringes upon the rights of other people and causes them harm, which is to say they're breaking into cars or homes to steal, you know, change or whatever to support their habit, you know, that's criminal behavior and people are being victimized. And there seems to be a lot of focus on, you know, the, some of the underlying causes. And while we don't always have the ability to control the situations that we find ourselves in, we do have an ability to change how we respond to them. And while I think there's a lot to be said that we've got to do as a community to get people into more permanent housing, I think we also need to recognize that there is a small element um, from the folks in the park that are not contributing to the community in a positive way. And I think that that is a frustration, particularly when it spills over to things like gun violence, that those of us who live, you know, just mere feet from the park, we kind of, it's a little bit of a concern for us. So I guess uh, probably a more targeted question, what, what's going to be the approach to deal with the perceived lawlessness in the park and the, you know, very blatant illegal activity that's going on there that seems to be, I don't know, maybe rising to the level of willful blindness. I mean, you know, you walk through there, you see what's going on. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't take, you know, a degree in criminology to see that we've got got an issue there. So I guess I'm just kind of curious, like, what's the plan to deal with some of the behavioral issues that are kind of spilling over into the, the larger community? Sure, I'll take a... No, it's all right. Um, you know, we're dealing with a system that was broken before the pandemic, broke worse during the pandemic, and is 
worse now. Um, you know, I think we had a lot of federal resources come into the state during the pandemic that helped meet some basic needs for folks. It didn't go all the way. And a lot of those resources, like um, the emergency rental assistance, are now being pulled back. So, you know, when we say, you know, changing our response to these things, I think pursuing the alternatives and committing to those and investing in them is how we change our response to this. Um, I think the easiest thing for us to do is say, oh, we just need to bring more law enforcement into this equation and that will solve the problem. And I, I think that's a flawed approach. I think we've seen it be flawed for decades. And I think if we just turn to that, if we just say law enforcement is the answer to this, then we're making a serious mistake and we're not committing to those alternatives that are going to create a safer, better community for us going forward. So, um, you know, I understand that there's a lot of discomfort downtown right now. There's a lot. It's very challenging to be confronted with the ways that society is failing so many people. Um, at the same time, I don't think the response to that is a larger law enforcement presence. Now, there are things that law enforcement will have to be involved in in terms of addressing gun violence, absolutely. But, you know, I think to turn to that as the only solution, we're going to continue to be uh, disappointed with uh, those results. So I think Representative Chino wants to add something. Yeah, I would add also with when, when Brian's done. <clears throat> I actually wanted to talk about this issue tonight um, because uh, Governor Scott, he released a 10 point plan um, to enhance uh, law enforcement and prevent and, and engage in violence reduction. And I wrote something that's going to become a front porch forum update. So you'll get more detail later, but about this issue, because it made me think like if we're trying to address violence, what is the root of violence? And the root of violence is violence. It's pain, it's suffering, harm, injury, trauma, betrayal, abandonment, injustice, guilt, shame, disgust, hate. And uh, Martin Luther King said, the ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Um, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And um, for thousands of years, societies have used force to get human behavior to change. But as a social worker, we think about human behavior being informed by the, the physical and social environment. And we have created a physical and social environment in our society where we are amplifying pain and trauma generation to generation. And the people who are, who are struggling, if you talk to them like I have at Sears Lane as a, as a therapist and as a, as a representative, Everyone has a trauma story, and a lot of people were in DCF custody, were abandoned, were, were hurt by the healthcare system, were hurt by the police, and, and have been in jail. And I think we do need to do something. At this point, we're enabling people to suffer and to spread suffering. And it, we're, it's like, um, it's neglectful, it's, it's, it's inhumane, but we can't just use force. And if we are going to use the force of the state, to intervene and say, we're gonna arrest you, we're gonna prosecute you, and we're gonna put you in jail, then we need to reform corrections. And so I'm really pushing in this year, I, we have a moment of opportunity here to follow four other states. Last week, California became the fourth state to pass legislation to begin exploring the, Nor the Norway model. And um, they join Idaho, North Dakota, and Connecticut. And I would like Vermont to take it to the next level. Uh, I've learned as a legislator that the world looks at California and Vermont because Vermont, California is one of the biggest economies and they're progressive leaning and Vermont does it on the rural scale. Governor News, uh, Newsom is gonna probably sign that bill based on his record. We should follow up in Vermont and show people how it's done on the rural level and take it up a notch, like start experimenting with community campuses. The core of the Norway model is that we're all neighbors. 
it's a mindset change that's community wide and it's not just in the, the facility. So the facility, you know, people might have to be locked up at first, but then, at, but then they can move into these community campuses that are basically villages with a wall around it where they're offered all the normal life activities. They can get paid, get tra job training, education, treatment. We can provide the highest level of care for the people who need it the most when, when we can confine them because they have violated the law. If we do that, we can break the cycle of violence. And there's more I have to say on this issue in the future, but I think we cannot let it continue. We have to enforce the laws, but we have to, instead of punishing people, we have to give them pathways to redemption and to healing. It, until we do that, until we like meet that, that pain with love, we're just gonna keep wounding generation, generation, generation. And so I think what we're seeing with meth arriving in Burlington on top of the pandemic is um, another level of, because of what it does to people. I, I did some research, there's no pharmaceutical yet that can be used like methadone for methamphetamines. However, recent studies at John Hopkins and other schools show that Iboga, a plant medicine, that an analog of that can be used. So that we're on the edge of some new treatments that are ancient that, that could be used to treat addiction. But until they're here, we should be giving people everything that we have available and we should be giving them those cutting edge treatments as they come out. And so I have a lot of ideas. I don't wanna take up more space, but I wanted to just speak to this because I came prepared for it. And I am gonna be following up with like some update because there's a lot more to this and I just wanna make space for others. So thanks for- Could I add something um, here? And if maybe the camera can just sort of pan back to Chris who asked the question so that I can, although I'm virtual, can see the person who asked the question. There you go, you're going, you're getting, there you go. Hi, Chris. Um, so I, I actually wrote out a 2000 word front page forum that I think uh, the, the central um, uh, front page forum at in the East uh, got. I don't know if you got that, Chris. Um, we, I should uh, make sure maybe Joe, um, can, can forward that. But um, you asked a question, you know, is there a plan? And what I, as a, as a city councilor, what I, I, I think Joe um, would, would agree with is the people who are in charge of public safety, the administration is the executive branch, we're the legislative branch. And so the question, which is a great question, you're, you're, you are echoing a question that's been asked all over this city. And that question really needs to be asked of the mayor and the chief, what is your plan? Now, there are components of this plan that everybody has talked about, but they include also, and in my mind, and I, I, I'm, I may be different than Joe in, in this, I think that a, a smart collaboration with the state police around bar closing and University of Vermont police makes sense to me. But I also think that a more robust use of the CSL, which is the mental health worker and the CSO programs at all hours of the day, once they get ramped up is a piece of this. And what I've found in my conversations with the chief on on, on like the neighborhood level, when we were when I've been talking, you know, in support support of of neighbors, um, is a resistance to use like the CSLs in a more robust way. So there is still a major job that we as policymakers and the city council, and particularly the public safety committee, need to to, to engage the administration in what I think. Um, I've, I've come to believe is an all of the above approach, right? Um, you know, I sat in 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, City Hall Park uh, on a couple of Sundays ago, and I just sort of watched, you know, for about an hour. And you know, there was actually nothing wrong, but you could see the inklings of behavior that will start to tend into a, a, um, a selfish, anti-social, anti, you know, good neighbor type um, activity. You, you could just see that, you know, there, there are people that are, that are just doing their thing and it can, it can bubble over um, 
whether the 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 assassination that happened the other night was that I don't think so. I think there's other issues that are engaged in there, and so it's 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 complex. And I just want to encourage you in your role as a commissioner and as a downtown resident to be pressing the mayor and the chief to be talking about a comprehensive plan because there is not there is we're all in these little silos and they're the people that hold the key so uh, i mean we're working on a lot of things and joe mentioned them brian has mentioned other stuff but you know at the heart of it we need leadership and i i i have to say in my opinion we are not getting that and i would just end by saying that the question of the pods and its relationship with church street is really one for brian uh, Pine, who, if he's gone, you know, because he, I mean, this is his project and it, it, I don't believe that it's a, a, I think it's a pretty special project and I've supported it because it fills a niche, but it is not the solution for everybody's um, issues and concerns on that. And he can deal with the details on that. That's all I had to say. Thank Thanks. You. I know we're getting close to the end here. I don't want to take up too much more time, but I will say that um, the administration will be making an announcement about the manager for the Elmwood Ave uh, community uh, tomorrow. Um, and, uh, you know, I think once that organization is in place, we're really going to be having those community conversations about um what that's going to look like going forward. So the target date for opening that is November 1st. Uh, I think we're sticking to that. I hope we're sticking to that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's all I have for that right now, but definitely more coming soon. I just want to share something about the pod village, or I think that's what we're calling it. Um, that when I was um, spending time at Sears Lane with people during the eviction, trying to learn the, um, assess what people's needs are, help people access resources, and just kind of learn like people's stories and listen to them. Um, people were living in this island with no connection to the neighbors around them. And that was one of the things that was start. Some neighbors would come in and help. There was some interaction, but it was like, like people had just been abandoned and left there to just do what they want, um, to hurt, the, to hurt themselves, others, um, and felt like uh, like one woman wrote a poem saying like we're we are nothing. That's how the poem was like we are nothing to you. You know, you say you care, but then in the end, we're nothing. You we're disposable. I I have hope that we're going to do it differently with this pod village. And what I'm really excited because Cito and I don't know if Brian Pine is still here, but I I have a lot of gratitude for them. They've supported Is Good Isham Street gardening and the other optimistic doings and our our work to garden on our street, which which has lowered crime rates even now comparatively 30 to 60% to the surrounding streets. And the gardening and the community building has changed the physical and social environment. The city is, it, next week I'm having a meeting with Cito and a resident from Sears Lane and we're gonna begin that work at the village. And we're gonna try to like, we're gonna plan gardens and we're gonna try to reach out to the neighbors from the start. And and that's my intention. That's what, and I'm, and I'm doing this not as a job, not as a state rep, I'm doing it as just a, a neighbor because what we need right now is to bring people back in as neighbors in the neighborhood. So if anyone wants to help us over the next year with the gardening, um, you can reach out to me because it, the vision is to completely garden, um, to sort of that wiggle, to spread the gardens out from Sears Lane and have, and I'm sorry, I called it that, but like the new encampment and link with the gardens on, on along the wiggle on Isham Street and the walkway we're cre creating there. And we are gonna need help with that um, over time, but the vision really is to like use greenways to bring neighbors together to change the social environment and research shows that greenways reduce violence. And so this is a way to kind of mend the fabric of our community during a rough time and change the infrastructure to change human behavior to be pro-social. So if anyone wants to be part of that, um, please reach out to me. And I just have a lot of gratitude to the, to the city for um, like believing in it and, and recognizing the benefit and giving us a chance because before Sears Lane was evicted, that's what people had decided to do. We were helping them garden and fix it up. And it was heartbreaking for people when they finally were like, people are helping us to have it taken away the way it was. 
So hopefully this is the beginning of a new chapter and someday we'll look back at this moment in history and say, this is when we woke up and we started treating people differently, so. Um, yeah, so we're at time or past, but that's great. Uh, thanks, everyone.